I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Cue the music. This drunken little German monk is intoxicated with himself. Sober him. Lighten up, Francis. Sober him. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade, a weekly theological podcast where we sit down at the kitchen table, pour ourselves an ice-cold beer, and talk about theology. Lutheran Lemonade, to gladden the heart of man. I am Ryan. You can find me at soundcloud.com forward slash Lutheran Lemonade. You can also watch this podcast on YouTube. Just look for 1517 Films, find the logo, and there you go. I'm also on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash 1517 Films, where in every episode on YouTube, I am contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But this, this is Lutheran Lemonade, and you're going to have to excuse the voice. I am getting desperately ill, but still... It's deeper, it's richer, it's more fun. So why not sit down with a frosty beer? Alcohol kills germs, doesn't it? I mean, right? Doesn't it? So on this episode of Lutheran Lemonade, I thought it would be appropriate to talk about something that I discovered in becoming Lutheran that was markedly different from anything I'd ever been taught before. And that thing is that There is a distinction in the Bible between law and gospel. That's right. That's right. There are two fundamental doctrines of the Bible, that of the law and that of the gospel. Now, when I was growing up a Christian, and especially in my formative high school years when I was interacting with other Christian friends of other denominations, I was told that the Bible is B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Yeah, you heard that sound of me biffing the microphone? That's what I think about B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. Oh, man. Oh, do I repent of those days. Look, the Bible is not basic instructions before leaving earth. Uh, That is an egregious thing that I think we could say about the Bible. Now, basic instructions before leaving earth as a concept is something that we can say of other holy texts, isn't it? Some other holy texts might include that there is a God. Some other holy texts might include that this God wants you to be a good person. The fundamental uh, modern day commandment, don't be a dick. Uh, summarized in the Bible is love your neighbor as yourself or do unto others as you would have done unto you. You can find this sort of morality, this moral law throughout all kinds of holy texts. But what sets the Bible apart as the authoritative source and norm for that only which can be called pure doctrine, Christian doctrine, is the doctrine of the gospel. The Bible is the only real, sacred, holy, religious text that contains a gospel. Now, you got to be asking yourself, what is the distinction between law and gospel? Well, a good place to start, uh, there are several of them, over 20 theses on uh, law and gospel in his great work, A uh, Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel, or this version that I have Uh, Law and Gospel, How to Read and Apply the Bible by C.F.W. Walther. Thesis 1 is the only one we're going to talk about right now. The doctrinal contents of all Holy Scripture, both of the Old and the New Testament, consist of two doctrines that differ fundamentally from each other. These doctrines... These two doctrines are law and gospel. I highly recommend picking up this book. It's available at Concordia Publishing House. You can get the old blue one that I had called A Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel or this one, Law and Gospel, How to Read and Apply the Bible. The Reader's Edition is an incredible version. Uh, it's always back there. It's part of what I would call what CPH calls the Essential Lutheran Library. <clears throat> Sincerest apologies. I I did say that I'm getting ill. So, and I think what's important about that thesis number one is that both the Old 
and the New Testament contain law and gospel. So when we hear law and gospel, we are not to believe Old Testament is law, New Testament is gospel. But both of them contain. Now, but we do have to define our terms. Law being the command of God, the will of God for mankind, what we must do, things which we must obey. God's law orders society uh, in one facet. In, in a second use, it shows us our sin and our need for a savior. In, in a third use, it gives shape to our Christian love to our neighbor. These are things that need to be done, things that need to be obeyed. And uh, the Christian set free by the gospel, which we'll talk about later, looks at God's law, loves God's law, and desires to keep God's law. And it is in our recognition, our inability to keep it, that we recognize and again are crushed by the law to realize for its, its second intended use, it's showing us our sin and our need for a savior. Now, that is the law in its simplest definition. And the Old Testament certainly contains the law but it also contains great, great gospel. Just like uh, the New Testament contains much law, do this, do this, do this. And in his Heidelberg disputation, uh, Luther would say, it is never done. Um, now the gospel, which says, believe this. So the gospel is not a work that we do. The gospel is the proclamation, the promise the promise that Christ has suffered and died and rose again in our place. And faith clings to the promise. I've heard preachers say in the past, obey the gospel. There's this phenomenal meme that goes around in theological circles on the internet. It's a beautiful painting of Christ on the cross. And that's all it is. It's just Christ, arms outstretched, head hung down low, hair in a knotted mess. And underneath it, it says the gospel. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you think it was something that you did? The gospel is what Christ has done for us. The gospel is the promise. So here's an example. <clears throat> of law and gospel in the Old Testament, in the Garden of Eden, when God condemned the sin of Adam and Eve and cursed the ground and told Eve that she would bear children in pain and that Adam would labor and that they would die. That is law. The gospel is when God said to the serpent that he would put enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, and the serpent would strike his heel. This is a promise of God. He promised to send from the seed of the woman a Savior, that in being struck by the serpent would thereby crush the head of the serpent. So even when God is condemning Adam and Eve in the garden, he speaks his second word, his gospel. His, 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 his primary word, maybe if we can call it that, is the gospel. He speaks promise. And faith, faith clings to that promise. But it's more than just looking at the Bible and saying, okay, so what's law and what's gospel? Is this verse law? Is this gospel? Well, I think it's fair to thrice divide the gospel, maybe. Definitely law and gospel. But there are some verses, honestly, that are neither. They are just history. Um... And some history contains law and gospel themes in it that foreshadow Christ. So a historical event uh, in the Bible, the story of David and Goliath, is a, a historical narrative, but it also prepares us for Christ. If you've ever read the Bible and thought that somehow you were David, and you need to go out and slay your Goliath. You need to um, face your giants. 
Um, you read it wrong. Uh, what is this true historical narrative telling me about who Christ is and what he has done for me? That Christ is the great David, the son of David that has slain the great Goliath, Satan. But there are other historical narratives like, let's say, the beginning of Matthew. It's just a, a litany of genealogies. And there's plenty of genealogies, who's begetting who, all over the Old Testament. These aren't necessarily law or gospel. These are just history. But when we understand that the Bible is divided into two major doctrines, that of the law and that of the gospel, and that both the Old and New Testament each contain law and gospel, it changes fundamentally how we read the Bible. Now, Remember when I said B-I-B-L-E, basic instructions before leaving earth. What a horrible, wretched thing to say about the Bible. God, forgive me for having ever spoken those words in my youth. If you go to the Bible for a task, what am I supposed to do today? Oh, you will find it. There are places to go in the Bible. What am I supposed to do today? You could read the narrative of the Ten Commandments. That would be a great place. How does God want you to live? He wants you to have no other gods. He wants you to honor the Sabbath day. He wants you to obey your parents. He wants you to not murder. He wants you to not slander. He wants you to not covet. <coughs> Apologies. I'm so sorry. This cough is just getting worse. There are th There's a plethora of things that you can find to do. But the whole of the Bible is a true historical account of everything that God has done to bring forth his son for the sole purpose of forgiving your sins. Yours. You. You listening. The Bible is better understood when we read it, understanding this is what God has done throughout all of human history to rescue me. All, and all of these laws that he gives, all of these commands that he gives that order society uh, or that show us our sin and need for a savior or that give shape to our, our Christian love for our neighbor. Well, I, I want to do them. But acknowledging, as Paul would say, the good that I want to do that I do not do. See, there's the second use of the law. Uh, but that which I do not want to do, that I keep doing. Uh, oh, wretched man that I am, Paul says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Praise be to God through Christ Jesus. So the gospel, the, and these terms need to be clearly defined. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Um, these terms need to be clearly defined in order to fundamentally change how we as Christians read the Bible. And this is very much, as I said at the beginning, outside of the norm of how I was instructed to read the Bible. And I'm very grateful that I don't have many of my old Bibles from my youth because I can remember sitting in class, should have been paying attention, but I was reading the Bible, circling all the things that I had to do, all of the commandments that I had to obey. What I never saw were the promises that were for me, that, that give me comfort when I realize I don't keep the law. Faith clings to the promise of the gospel that Christ was crucified, dead, and buried for me. That is the gospel. So the gospel is not something that can be obeyed by us because the gospel is the obeying of the law by Christ in our place and suffering all, even death, on a cross for you. So if we go to the scriptures and we're looking for basic instructions before leaving earth well then why do we even need the bible for that we can get basic instructions before leaving earth by reading the quran although oh gosh i want my i want my podcast to stay online so we're just going to leave it there look there's morality and good living in other 
sacred texts, just like there is the Bible. But what sets the Bible apart is that in and amongst those commands to do good, to love and to serve your neighbor, to act and live decently in society, is the revelation, that second use of the law, that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And what sets the Bible apart is that it boldly proclaims the promise of that Savior. That's what sets the Bible apart from any other holy text. All of these holy texts can clearly tell us how to live a good, moral, decent life, and they can even by implication, although not as flat out as the Bible does, tell us you fall woefully short of the standard. The Bible proclaims this second word to us, that God has accomplished it all in our place. So while the world may revile Christianity because we believe that we are not good enough in spite of our inward sinful being telling us you're good enough. (coughs) I'm really sorry I keep coughing. I feel so bad. Maybe it's that coronavirus. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. This isn't Corona that I'm drinking. This is a Wisconsin brew, because um, I'm Wisconsin. But I digress. Where was I? Ah, uh, yes. So uh, the law and the gospel. Look, if you want to fundamentally change how you read the Bible and grow in your faith, understand this: the Old Testament contains two words from God: His law. And his gospel. And when you, out of Christian love and new obedience to do good works, want to obey the law, you shouldn't be discouraged so much that you don't keep it, but definitely be repentant of your inability to keep it and recognize and cling to God's second word, his promise, the gospel, that Jesus Christ has done it all for you by suffering and dying and rising again. So again, from the the, uh, Heidelberg disputation, the law says, do this, and it is never done. The gospel says, believe this, and because of Christ, everything is accomplished already. And in this distinction of law and gospel, while there is sorrow over sin, there is repentant joy. There's, excuse me, there's not just repentance and woe and sorrow and dread and flagellating yourselves uh, so that you can prove yourselves worthy. There is repentance, yes, but it is repentant joy because faith clings to the promise that Christ has died for you. And when you go to the Bible, understanding this, looking for not so much, what am I supposed to do today? But how does God want me to live? And what has Christ done for me? The Bible, as is popular to say in many conservative confessional Lutheran circles, the Bible is not about you. The Bible is about Jesus for you. And I would be remiss as we wrap this episode up because I'm feeling my throat go and getting a headache um, because I am definitely, definitely under the weather. As we wrap this episode up of Lutheran Lemonade, I want you to be gladdened in your heart, O oh man, that there are two words from God in his holy Bible, that of the law and that of the gospel. And when you devote yourself to reading the scriptures... You can read the law, understand the law, desire to obey God's law, and when you realize that you fall woefully short, with repentant joy cling to the promise of the gospel that Christ has suffered and died for you in your place and has risen victorious over sin, death, and the power of the devil for you on an individual level. Yes, of course, Christ died for the whole of creation, for all of mankind. But this promise from God's word is for you. That's what makes it gospel. It is good news for 
you. And then, then you're not going to read about Daniel in the lion's den and dare to be a Daniel. You're not going to read about David and Goliath and strive to be David. You're going to see how David is a type and foreshadow grounded in human history of Christ for you. This has been Lutheran Lemonade. I am Ryan. Until next time, God's richest, richest blessings on your time with him in his holy word, his law and his gospel.